professor velutal welcome to sapedia you are one of the most uh, distinguished historians of uh, pre colonial south india i don't know uh, you have been a practitioner of the historian's craft for a long time since early 70s that is almost uh, half a century now and you have taught history you have taught history for about 40 years now to be a historian uh, i think is not a very popular choice in india as elsewhere can you tell us how you ended up making this choice and uh, i cannot quite say that i made the choice i did not make the choice my interest was in literature when i was a student in school uh, i did a little bit of science in my college and after that i couldn't continue my college education so i had to settle for a diploma program in rural services where uh, i had to do a little bit of uh, economics and history but uh, after that i wanted to do a masters in malayalam literature i went to calicut university to inscribe for the masters program there in literature but when i got down from the bus the teacher who taught me malayalam literature in the undergraduate program he was there at the bus stop that was for tutors he stopped me and asked me where i was headed to i said i want to do this uh, literature in malayalam then he shouted at me he told me that you have a genuine interest in literature don't kill it by doing a masters in it <laughs> so he literally hijacked me to history department and took me to history department where mgs narayan was the head of the department at that time mgs tried his best to dissuade me but the more he dissuaded the more adamant i was that i should do history there was another reason also history doing a main history would have fetched me a handsome fellowship because i was the top in the qualifying examination which i wouldn't have gotten in malayalam mm so that was a consideration so this pecuniary consideration of a fellowship in mm together with the fact that mgs narayanan was himself a leading literary figure of malayalam made me compromise and i got into history department and I started doing mm in history but when we uh, progressed a little i realized that the kind of history that they are teaching there was different from the kind of history that i was familiar with in school and uh, college and there was less emphasis on wars alliances treaties engagements etc there was less emphasis on empires states their administrative system the succession dates etc things which horrified students of history that was absent from history department in calicut instead they emphasized more on culture more on society more on economy etc that was a one feature another very interesting aspect was uh, somewhere in the beginning of the 70s calicut university had thoroughly revised the syllabus for the ma program it included a heavy content of regional history regional history would uh, uh, mean doing kerala history and uh, those days there was no decent uh, textbook of kerala history now this is not to say that you have too many today <laughs> sadly sadly that is the story even today so there were no textbooks of uh, history uh, kerala history so mgs narayanan was doing it from the sources inscriptions literary texts some excavation reports which were available with the help of this he was teaching i was able to resonate with that very well particularly because i had some smattering of sanskrit which my father had taught me so with this i was able to communicate very well i used to discuss things in the class which unlike most other teachers mgs encouraged and usually teachers do not encourage students asking questions but uh, mgs was different he was doing it so in this way we we progressed that was uh, one the other was an optional paper that we had now the first paper in ma program we had eight papers first paper in ma program was what is called a general essay without any preparation go to the examination hall they would give you five questions about one of them write for 3 hours an essay and so this prospect of uh, filling the answer book with uh, so much of gas was there 
<laughs> and then uh, the, the other alternative was doing a dissertation, which would involve going to primary sources, picking up uh, strange scripts and archaic languages, uh, doing hard work in the field, etc. So nobody, nobody had uh, traded the uh, former <laughs> for the latter. But I was foolish enough to go to MGS Narayan and insisted that I would do it. So these two together, one is a greater emphasis on sources in the courses that were being taught and also this practical training in the business of doing history. These two together really interested me. So this is how I came to history, historical research, discipline of history, etc. And the training that I had after that in JNU, that also came in very handy. That stood me in good stead because I was exposed to the different kinds of debates that were going on in the discipline. I was uh, also lucky to have met a large number of uh, scholars, practitioners of history both in India and abroad and this way. And again, the acquaintance that I had with uh, this uh, body, Indian History Congress. So all these together, I believe, was responsible for my finally accepting what was thrust on me as my own choice. Now, I will be proud to say that if only I had chosen it. Although I did not choose, choose it, it was actually my choice. You said you learned uh, Sanskrit from your father. That's Can right. Can you tell us a bit about your Sanskrit learning, uh, the process of learning? Now that is, uh, no, this was the very, very traditional way in which uh, you first pick up uh, all the all the declensions of nouns, conjugations of verbs, etc. Then learning the dictionary by heart, Amaragosha. This is the this is the kind of pedagogy which is perhaps the wrong kind of pedagogy. Uh, this is the way in which I was taught. My father had employed a private uh, tuition master to teach us uh, Sanskrit. He was a great scholar. But his scholarship and his uh, teaching abilities, they did not have any relationship uh, uh, with one another. He was an extremely poor teacher. And the result was that uh, by the end of the third year of his teaching me, the only thing that uh, the two of us gained was three years of age, <laughs> not, not, nothing more. And so I developed a hatred for Sanskrit. And that continued uh, perhaps after, after about uh, four or five years after that, after my initiation into Vedic studies, a Vedic scholar used to come and uh, teach me Vedas. That was even more horrible. So the horror of learning Sanskrit, the horror of uh, learning Vedas, etc. prevented me from doing anything seriously there. But after some time, what happened was, my father had a friend, a great Sanskrit scholar, a different kind of a Sanskrit scholar. Once he chided me for not reading the uh, large number of books that uh, my father had in his collection. I told him, but sir, these are all in Sanskrit. So what? If it is written by a human being, it be, a human being should be able to read it. Then he suggested that I take Mahabharata, read the first words in the Mahabharata, go to Kunyikutandamuran's translation, read the first words there. Like that, you read hundred verses. And by the time you re uh, uh, reach the hundred and first, I can dispense with the Malayalam translation. So this is actually the way in which I had picked up a bit of... Uh, now this happened before I had joined the MA. And in fact, I joined the diploma program qualifying me for the MA. So by, by the time I reached the MA program, I couldn't read and interpret uh, Sanskrit texts all by myself. Now that ability I had. Would uh, you say you uh, fell from the roof into Sanskrit the way uh, Kosambi said? No, I did not. I did not fall from the roof because, because Sanskrit was there all over. It was not an accident. And in fact, I was trying to escape Sanskrit, which I could not do. And finally, I, I reached where I should. So it's not uh, quite the Kosambi way of uh, falling into Indology. 
from what do you think of the origins of history as a discipline in India? Do you think it has a very rigorous academic backgrounds or does it have a popular element as well? Does it have popular origins as uh, Deepesh Chakravarti has uh, very recently argued? Because history, I guess, is the uh, only discipline which is so closely intertwined with the question of uh, identities, a variety of identities, mm. national identity, mm. regional identity, mm. caste, mm. Uh, linguistic identity, religious mm. identity. Mm. And that, for that reason, evokes a lot of passion as well. Mm. So do you think there is a popular trajectory of origin for history as a discipline in India? Well, I do not know. And I haven't read what uh, Chakravarti has uh, written. But I am not very sure if uh, history had popular origins in India. You know, from the very early times when we had recorded evidence of uh, historical consciousness expressing itself. We see it, uh, say, for example, from the Vedic literature itself, what we call the Gatha, Narasamsi, etc. in the Vedic literature were a, a chief uh, in, a, in a position where he can patronize bards and minstrels was uh, being sung about, his praise was being sung about, and this was taken up. Uh, later, by the time we come to, for example, Mahabharata, etc., it is the same tradition of bards and minstrels singing the praise of uh, the chieftain, trying to legitimize the person in uh, uh, power, and that person reciprocating by gifts, munificent gifts to the bard who is uh, so singing. Like this, it uh, goes on. We have the same tradition in the Buddhist uh, tradition, uh, the Jatakas and other uh, historical consciousness, Jain tradition we have. It goes on like that. And by the time we come to what historians recently start uh, calling the early medieval phase of uh, history, we have the same expression uh, in the Prashasti literature, in the court chronicles, court histories, for Raja Terengini, for example, and then also dynastic chronicles. So we have the historical biographies like Banas, Harsha Charita. So in historical biographies, in court chronicles, in dynastic traditions, in processes, you have this expression. Again, by the time the sultans Establish the Turko of guns, establish uh, air power here. It is again the same tradition of uh, court chronicles, although linked with the origin of Islam and uh, other elements there. It is this that we see. So, all through we see that the origin of history here is related to power, positions of power, those who are wielding power, and also those who are in a, in a situation where they can. Uh, provide patronage for those who are singing this praise. Then a break comes around the 18th century. Around the 18th century and uh, behind this break we can see two factors. One is at the, at the world level you see history graduating as an academic discipline, as a branch of knowledge instead of, uh, instead of just a tradition. So, between the medieval kind of chronicles that we have in the West and the kind of history that was written in Berlin in the 18th century uh, with uh, Leopold von Rank or Theodor Mommsen or uh, Niebuhr, with uh, this kind of a change where history was now looked upon a, a very, very rigorous discipline as knowledge constructed by a critical analysis of sources, interrogation of evidence, then uh, perhaps joining together bits and pieces of information which is so teased from this evidence. So history graduates into a kind of uh, knowledge by the time we come to the 18th century. This is all over the world. It is against this background that uh, the British East India Company in India establishes its uh, political power, that is political mastery, taking over the Diwani rights from the Mughal Empire. So now the officers of the English East India Company, they were brought up in the new tradition of enlightenment, new tradition of uh, historical scholarship, etc. in the West. And with that, they were in a position to look into the past of India. 
it was a necessity also for them. When the English East India Company established itself in India, they had the necessity of uh, producing knowledge about India, which was a means of domination also. With, uh, with uh, knowledge in your hands, knowledge as power, I know this is well known. So, two factors were necessary there. One is to reject the traditional knowledge. Whatever India knew about their past, this is nonsense, this is legend, this is absolute rubbish. So, rubbishing that on the one side and then uh, replacing that with proper knowledge, proper within quotes, which we have produced about you. So, we know better about you than yourself. Now, this fits into the pattern of the dictum that the master knows better. So, when the master pretended that I know better, naturally the subjects accepted it. And so, this is even there. So, like in the pre-modern tradition, starting from the Vedic Gatha Narasamsi, going through the Prasasti, Dynastic Chronicle, then the core literature in Persian and uh, uh, the, the uh, Mughal documents, all through what we see is this is a function of power. And uh, I don't quite find any popular origin for history there. This is not to, not to say that there is nothing popular. At the popular level in the folklore, etc., there is this appeal to the past. Now, for example, you have a large number of uh, folk songs, folk stories, which, uh, which people go about telling. And this has influenced some of the stories, for example, Chand Bardai. No, no, we have, we have such a tradition influenced by the folk tradition. But when we look at uh, history as a branch of knowledge, history as a discipline, the influence comes more from positions of power and patronage than from popular origin. This is my feeling. Mm -hmm. You refer to history as a form of knowledge. That's a more recent phenomenon, maybe about uh, 200 years old. Yeah. Why do you think history as a discipline is uh, so contested? You know, a wide range of questions are asked about history. Does it constitute an epistemology? Is it a valid form of knowledge? Isn't there an element of uh, plot making or storytelling or fiction in history? Uh, how do you respond to these debates? Uh, now, this is to be seen at two levels. One is when history was uh, constituted as a, as a branch of knowledge. And there was uh, less of interest in the storytelling part of it than about the analytical and uh, critical part of it. Uh, at the same time, in recent years with, uh, with uh, writers like uh, Hayden White and uh, others, they see that this is another form of narration, this is another form of, uh, you, know, you have the plotment, and there is no difference between literature and history. In fact, in fact it is uh, said in lighter vein that the only difference between literature and history is that everything except dates are wrong in history and everything except dates are right in literature. <laughs> no, but but uh, here, what we, what we see is that uh, that kind of an understanding of uh, meta-history like uh, Hayden White, that kind of an understanding perhaps takes away the critical part of uh, history. History is a very rigorous discipline, which is knowledge produced by the interrogation of uh, evidence critical understanding of evidence, that is negated there. It has its own critical method, it has its own various level, how information is gathered, how this information is woven into knowledge, etc. This is very, very clearly there. That is also why there is so much of fear of history. Nobody fears literature, but history, history people are mortally afraid of particularly because particularly because history has this uh, very very great potential of uh, standing in the way of people who are seeking to to get to power and to remain in power that is why those who are in power have always feared history more than any other branch of knowledge uh, since you refer to Hayden White White was writing at a time when you had begun research into history 
But uh, your generation of historians, be you or Subbarailu or Karashima, they don't seem to be producing narratives, unlike Dilakanta Shastri. They are not. They are not giving us a chronological account, or there's no employment in it, no storytelling. From that perspective, is it possible to uh, uh, have a different look at Hayden White, a different critique of Hayden White? No, no. That is that is precisely what I was saying. Now the narrative part of history certainly is there. For example, if you if you give a choice between reading a, an eminently readable book, like for example our good old Stanley Lane Poole, mm -hmm. and a very thick kind of analysis of the agrarian system as in Irfan Habib, it is certainly better to read Lane Poole as a bedtime book. But if you want it, want to engage with history in a very serious manner, I'll keep aside uh, Hayden White, uh, sorry, uh, Lane Pool and the reader Fun Habib. So my preference is always for the critical, the analytical part of uh, history than the narrative, readable part of uh, history. So I don't believe that history is just another storytelling. Mm -hmm. History is rigorous knowledge. Your first work appeared in 1978. <laughs> uh, it was on the Brahmin settlements in Kerala. Right. right. Uh, it was a, a, a landmark publication in Kerala history, a widely cited book. What do you think of the significance of uh, this work uh, four decades later? Significance in the larger context of the historiography of Kerala of uh, 1970s. Well, here I will have to use the benefit of hindsight also. I did not think of these things at that time, but now when I look back, I think one of the one of the major factors which made it important was the historiographical background in which uh, I happened to write that book. One is there was this uh, acrimonious debate, or quarrel is a better word, between Elangolam Gunjan Bullai on the one side and uh, Kanipayur mm -hmm. Shankar Nambudiripal on the other. Elangolam Gunjan Bullai was basing himself on an analysis of uh, data in inscriptions and literature. And uh, Shankarana Bodhiripad was writing more from sentiments than from arguments. So uh, this kind of this kind of a uh, situation where the atmosphere was very vitiated, that was the background against which I started to in fact I started working on this in 72, 73. Mm -hmm. I was telling you about the dissertation that we had as an option. And it was there that I started looking at the Chaira inscriptions for evidence on the Brahman settlements that we have. Now about the 32 settlements mentioned in the Kerolpati, etc. What I was able to see there was that what Kerolpati contained was not a, a series of uh, stories which, according to Elankulam, was an invention of Nambudri sometime in the 17th century. To, to justify the possession of wealth he had. Now on the, other side, on the other hand, I was able to see that at least from the 8th century, 9th century, this tradition was very widely there, very, very deeply entrenched in the psyche of people, as we can see from inscriptions in Kerala, from inscriptions outside Kerala, referring to Kerala. For example, in the 10th uh, century, Rajaraja speaks about having conquered Kerala. But Kerala is described there as the country created by Rama, mm -hmm. who had taken this vow to destroy all the Kshatriyas. Sarva Kshatra Vatha Vrata Pradayina Ramayana Yan Nirmitam Rashtra. Tiruvalangadu Kopra Plains. So, so what I am saying is that uh, it's not it's not a 17th century invention. I also saw that all the 32 settlements that Kerala speaks about are attested by evidence, uh, either epigraphical or surviving Brahmanical traditions or temples which are even today standing live temples where uh, worship uh, go on. So, I was able to see that this was uh, uh, the, the case. A second thing that I was able to see is that unlike what uh, Elankulam saw in the inscriptions, Elankulam believed that uh, during the time of the Jairas from the 9th century to 12th century, 
the local administration in the kingdom were centered on the brahmanical temples in bodies called ur sabha etc he believed that these were popular democratic organizations where you had brahmans and non brahmans as members but when i looked into the documents i saw that members of these bodies were invariably brahmans so instead of looking at them as uh, democratic popular bodies i was able to see them as uh, caste corporations of an oligarchic nature that is corporations of upper caste non cultivating land owners placed above a cultivating peasantry this changed the picture completely having implications for understanding the later periods of kerala history because alangolam believed that in the 11th century 12th century where he imagined the there was a 100 years war between the cheras and the cholas all the able bodied men of the nair and other communities went to the war front leaving this land here so the brahmans started appropriating this land so this question of brahmans appropriating in the land in the 11th century and 12th century doesn't arise when it was already a brahmanical property so whole land around the temples were brahmanical property either as property of the temple devasan or the private property of the brahman families brahmaswa so when this was the situation where is the question of their appropriating it at a later point in time so elangolam's thesis about the evolution of the jenmi system landlordism that uh, loses its uh, basis so when i was able to see that uh, no no i was i was also able to show that elangolam was wrong also on the understanding of a patrilineal system of course i haven't uh, written that in that book but the landlordism being a very major aspect and the bodhri landlordism the bodhri jenmi system being a major aspect i had to engage with that directly in this book so in this way i thought that the the historiographical background of this uh, very very vitiated kind of quarrel between elangolam and kani payu or the bodhripal this was the background against which that book has to be seen and i am glad that uh, it uh, was received well by the academy although although it was written by a student doing his uh, masters program it received the attention that it uh, deserved i'm glad that it received i have a question uh, related to the 100 years war that you mentioned if you look at uh, south indian historiography you find a uh, 100 years war you find a uh, byzantine mon- mon- uh, monarchy you also find a war of vettam succession yeah. what do you make of that <coughs> no this is uh, no i used to i used to say this in the class you can think only in categories which you are familiar with no i am never tired of telling this story in the class now there was a, there was a, a school in the second standard the teacher gave them an assignment write 10 sentences about a poor family so one of the students came back with a, an essay in 10 sentences there was a poor family the father was poor the mother was poor the cook was poor the gatekeeper was poor the car driver was poor the gardener was poor everybody was poor in the family and therefore so this child is familiar with a family with all these uh, constituents there and if it has to be poor family all these constituents should be poor in the context of indian historiography particularly in the second half of the 19th century and early 20th century indian historians were trained by historians who had written european history so when for example a historian like ap jaiswal or a historian like rk mukherji or a historian like rc majumdar or a historian like nilakanth shastri or altaker all the all the prominent historians of the first generation of india when they were writing history the model that they had was the model of european history 
So they invariably started thinking about empires, about republics, K.P. Jaiswar, mm -hmm. about republics, about uh, local self-government, R.K. Mukherjee and then your friend G.N. Dikshit <laughs> from Karnataka, from Karnataka. All, the, all these could think about history only within these digits. So naturally, in order to be intelligible, you have to think in terms of the categories that you are familiar with. So in the context of Indian history also, so history will not be complete without a hundred years war. History, you know, we, have, we have read about a hundred years war in the context of European history, England and France getting engaged in this hundred years war. So, if Kerala and uh, Tamil Nadu or uh, Cholas and Cheras were in war, why not a hundred years war? And in European history, when the, when the uh, succession to the throne of Austria was such a contested thing which almost grew into the dimensions of a uh, world war in Europe. So, this tiny principality of Vettam from which uh, I happen to come, this tiny principality of Vettam, which is less than a taluk today, the, the, the successor to the throne, he took the assistance of the Raja of Cochin and that becomes a war of Vettam succession. So, you know, this, is, this is because of the way in which history, you know, historians find it very difficult, not just historians. Any understanding has to be through categories that you are familiar with. Perhaps that is the reason. Now, now I am ready to give a greater concession to historians who use expressions like this. That is why, that is why, for example, uh, the Chora Empire becomes a centralized empire with a Byzantine royalty there. That is why, for example, you have this compromise between the federal and the centralized in the Chora Empire in the writings of Nilagandha Shastri. That is why we have uh, all this uh, Mukherjee's and the Majumdars using categories like uh, Greater India, Cultural Colonies, etc. Because without colonization, etc., what history are you talking about? And this is this is because of perhaps our our uh, problem of understanding. Without, uh, you will not be able to understand unless you are using categories which you are familiar. With. Now that is what I thought. Uh, now I am now I am more charitable than I used to be about thirty years ago. <laughs>